Uh, yeah. How would you like me to address you? Tom? Thomas? Uh, Mr. yeah. Thomas? Uh, Tommy is fine. Tommy. Yeah, okay. Funny. Greg's fine for me, too. Uh, yeah, my name's Greg Wolford. I'm a Canuck up here up north, and uh, I'm 27, and I have a degree in political science. But more than that is that I've been getting into philosophy for the past three years on YouTube. And uh, getting really, really, I find that there's not too many channels that, a matter, as a matter of course, cover the CTMU. Yeah. I've looked at your channel, and I'm, I'm amazed that you've got 27 videos out in the space of since you joined in what, October of last year. Like that's that's ambitious, and I thought this is an ambitious young man. I'm gonna, I'm gonna not that much younger than me, but I'm gonna let him interview me because heck, heck, I think you're gonna go far. Keep producing what you're producing, and but yeah, I've been making videos for. I don't make too many. Uh, proportionally speaking, I don't make a lot of videos, but I do a lot of reading in between each video. Yeah. So I find that's where the qual maybe the quality is. Uh, I'm not saying your quality is bad or anything. I'm just saying for me, I'm not. I'm kind of. Late, I'm more European in my work habits, laid back and yeah, yeah. So I don't know if that's. Uh, so I've been covering Chris Langan. Uh, I put out a video uh, January seventh of last year, and uh, it got the most views of my channel, seven point four thousand views, which for me is a lot. I'm just a small fried channel too. Uh, but yeah, I, I got so many things wrong in that video so many things wrong uh but I've, I've been it's a learning process and you learn the best by uh by doing by teaching right so if you yeah. keep at it then yeah no i i that was the one of the that was actually one of the first um ctmu videos that i that i saw um way back um, oh yeah yeah good yeah. that's good to hear <laughs> yeah no, the um I don't, you can't i don't know if you can see this but the uh i did i did the head shave in january Oh, you did? I read, I read your, uh, your Substack article. Oh, wow. I don't know. So, yeah, uh, the, the gnosis, the head shave, because monks yeah. do it, the military yeah. does it. Yeah. yeah, that's good, eh? Yeah, I, I keep her close. I used to have long hair, but I keep her close now. That's good. You read my article. Yeah, somebody's yes. reading it. You're the well, one. So I'll just um, start off. So the um, in your in your bio, and you know, you should every everyone watching should check out all all of um. Greg socials, you know, YouTube, Substack, um, any, uh, any others, but the, uh, it says, I, I have a website that directs people to my YouTube and to my Substack. Well, ch check out the website to direct you to the Substack, the, um, but it says your, um, your mission, mission is, is twofold. The, um, the first is, um, the, um, at the sharing the, the gospel, the universal Christ event and, um, in fourfold, and I have it here. It's cruciform theocracy, unification of kingdom and cross, um, anticipation of resurrection, and what, what? What's the fourth one? So the, actually, you got you got the two uh, mixed up there. It was oh, first, it was that. cruciform theocracy. Mm -hmm. Then it's heaven to earth restoration of space time. Yeah, that's the second one. And then uh, third one is kingdom and cross metaphysic. And then the fourth one is anticipation of the resurrection, mm -hmm. life after life after death and the new Jerusalem, which if you're a Christian, if you follow the New Testament, N.T. Wright's just when N.T. Wright says something, he's mm -hmm. just reestablishing yeah. what the authenticity of the gospel was. Right. Yeah. So the um, and then the second fold is, of course, you know, sharing propagating the, the CTMU. The CTMU, yeah. yeah. So the uh, so I'm gonna start start with the the first one because the um, while I was doing, you know, the ba background research both on your uh, your channel and in NT Wright's work, the of the cruciform theocracy. That um, could you explain that concept? Because at first, when I when I heard it, I thought of you know like a almost like a Christian version of the Taliban, but it's like, <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's um. But it, it's actually, you know, um, a, a really profound idea that I said. So could you? So all this is from NT Wright's work, and if you yeah. watch, if um, if you're out there and you're wa and you're looking to get into this, uh, just watch his videos. He, he talks about the cruise form theocracy in, in several of his videos. But what it is essentially is that, well, Christ, what does his rulership look like? It doesn't look like the Taliban because it's yeah. not tanks rolling in thunder. It's not the tanks rolling through the Ardennes forest into France. That's not what Christ's kingdom looked like. His kingdom, this is a good example N.T. Wright uses, uh, when when Peter and I think John were asking to sit beside Jesus at the Last Supper, he said, no, you must go to the other ends of the table because the greatest amongst you must be the greatest servants. 
so the king, my uncle was giving me a hard time about this too because he's he's a secular. He likes secularism and he likes uh, he doesn't like biblical authority or anything like that. But I said, what does the Christian kingdom actually look like? And actually, Christ is ruling whether you acknowledge it or not. Mm-hmm. Christ is, has rulership on the earth. He rules uh, through people on the earth. But his kingdom, when you're part of the kingdom and you start to see everything around you as a kingdom, then it starts to be that uh, cruciform democracy is that you're a great servant to mankind. He washed the feet, like he, what did Christ do? He washed the feet of the disciples, right? Mm-hmm. He didn't. He didn't point he, when and when Peter, I think, struck a Roman soldier on the ear in the Garden of Gethsemane. I can't pronounce that word very well, but he struck his ear and he, Jesus healed it because he said, "This is not the way that we're gonna comport ourselves on the earth." Right. Yeah. So cruciform theocracy, it, you, you could take it. There is a, a brand of it where you could take Christian nationalism into account. Mm-hmm. And there's a great book I'm reading. I forget who wrote it, but it's on. It's a new book. It's it's called The Case for Christian Nationalism. Mm-hmm. And the way they present it is, well, would you rather have an atheist rule over you, or would you rather have a Christian rule over you as your earthly ruler? I would say generally, I'd probably pick the Christian, but that's not exactly what the kingdom looks like, right? Mm-hmm. The kingdom looks like what I said is. This being a servant of men. Yeah, so that's uh, that's interesting, and we'll get into the. Uh, I have a couple things on Christian nationalism and the and politics later, but it's all. But it's interesting because the um, I was watching also the um, that the that one of the statements is you know that that you made anything and anti right does is that Christ rules through the meek, and it's interesting. The Jordan Peterson on the Joe Rogan experience made it made a comment that I said. That the translation as um as meek from the Greek is um is not quite right. That to have your sword is. sheathed, right? Mm-hmm. To have a sword, but to have it sheathed. Yeah, I think that, it's what Pearson says something like that, right? Yeah, to have a that you have the capacity for violence, but that's integrated within you know a kind of yeah. higher being. So that's kind of the union conception and, of the self. And it kind of ties in with uh, the second point, with his, which is having to Earth restoration of space time, mm-hmm. and what that means is that. Uh, this life is not a test. This life, it, we're living in the kingdom currently. Yeah. And heaven is meant to come to earth. This is what people, the cra- classic Christian conception that most popular Christians have is that you check a box and you go to heaven or you check a box and you go to hell. And that the earth will, the heavens and earth will pass away it means that everything's going to be burned up in a big fireball and then heaven's going to come down. But it's actually the case that like in Isaiah with the renewing of the spring of the waters, the renewing of the greenery of the earth, that the earth is meant to get better and better. Like that's the post-millennial millennial series, right? The earth gets yeah. better and better. And then Christ returns when it's it's gotten to a, a certain threshold, I think. Yeah. But yeah, so the, the meek the meek going out into the world, they're meant to make the world better as they, as their is their capacity. And like yeah. you say, the sword is sheathed, but you have you can draw it out. Yeah. Yeah. So, and some, yeah, oh, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh yeah. No, the uh, yeah, and in some sense that the uh, that Jesus is almost like the symbol of that because he has this uh, this kind of like godly power, but he also, you know, doesn't retaliate. He prays for those who persecute him, you know, love your enemy, etc. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yes. Yeah, so it's interesting the um also the what do you think the kind of connection is between the idea of cruciform theocracy by anti writing kind of the human singularity under uh, under Chris Langan because the, these concepts seem kind of correlated. Well, well, I'm glad that you uh, bring it up and I see that your channel's called the CTMU Singularity, yeah. so it's probably a pretty big theme in your work. Yeah. Uh, but I, I, heard, I had somebody in the comments say, Chris Langan isn't a true Christian because he puts other mm-hmm. religions on par with Christianity as, yeah. a, as, as part of meta-religion. And I mm-hmm. thought that's not quite, quite what he's saying. What he's saying... He actually says in his, his his article, and I forget what the article's called, but something like meta religion, something towards meta religion, and uh, it says in that article that the the Christ event is a singularity he's working towards. Yeah. Right. He says the Christ event is a singularity he's working towards, and it's it's not just because Christians already have the most followers and therefore it's most likely to succeed. It's that it's actually those connections to the truth. So cruciform theocracy. Uh, the CTM and the way I the way I view this is mm-hmm. that the CTMU is is it, nothing can add to scripture. Yeah, nothing can add on to scripture. But you have to recognize that mm-hmm. in, every time we interpret something, it's usually through the lens of philosophy. Mm-hmm. So if we interpret scripture through the lens of Rene Descartes, 
we're going to have a dualism running down our scripture yeah. that separates truth from, from subject or uh, subject to object of the universe, all those dualisms. Whereas I think Chris Lang is not just an epistemic, he's also a metaphysic that dovetails with Christianity. And you yeah. were, I was watching your video on uh, the Bible study, the part two, Bible study part two, and you had said something, you had said in there that religion is above metaphysics. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of similar to one of the videos I made. I, I made a video where I said ethics is above metaphysics. Yeah, so, no, it was actually based on that, the title. Oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's good. That. I'm glad somebody's listening. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's ethics. It's ethics is here. Metaphysics is in the middle. I disagree with you here. I think ethics is above metaphysics. Metaphysics is grounded on epistemology. And religion just draws a circle around all three of them yeah. and distributes over them. Yeah. Yeah, so the, um, well, I'm, um... Yeah, so, or sorry, uh, one oh, moment. The, yeah. yeah, so the, um, yeah, so it's interesting, the, um, the, ne the next thing is the restoration of, um, you know, heaven to earth space time order. So the, um, it's interesting, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm Jewish, the, there's this concept in, I um, thought you were, because you pronounced a lot of the Hebrew words, like, like that, and I'm like, yeah. it's, it's got it. did you practice, like, your Torah and stuff, for, uh, what's it called, your, for, bar mitzvah? What, bar mitzvah? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I did, um, I yeah. did, I did the whole, the whole, the whole shebang, yeah. but the, uh, but there's this idea in the, um, in Judaism of the creation of the universe as, um, simsum, as essentially the self-contraction of God, that there's no, um, that there's, um, that there's no real dual, or at least in the mystical strands of Judaism, that there's no real duality between heaven and between heaven and earth, that everything is embedded within God, but that he, God is almost kind of like locally confusing himself for the purpose of understanding himself. So the, uh, God yeah. is locally confusing himself for the purpose of understanding himself. Yeah. Huh? Yeah, so the I went I went over that in the video. The way I see it is, that, and I've had people in my church comment and say, "Well, heaven and earth are separated." Yeah. And uh, heaven won't, and they disagree with me on this point. They say that heaven will not come down to earth. But you see this in the tabernacle with the with the Exodus story that God is mm -hmm. telling them to build a tabernacle, and He dwells amongst His people to call them a fire that comes down, right? Yeah. He comes and dwells with it amongst His people, and then it's believed that with Christ. You're not only not only is Christ coming down in the flesh, but everybody mm -hmm. that becomes a believer partakes the Holy Spirit becomes part of the body of Christ, and this gets into another category. I don't know if you've seen this. I don't know if I've had this much in my work, but it's called Christ mysticism. Mm -hmm. It's by the 20th century Reformed theologian Albert Schweitzer. He's a German guy, and he talks about Christ mysticism and how Paul was big on uh, justification by faith was just a small crater. Within yeah. a larger crater that is Christ mysticism, being in Christ, being in the body, being part of the body. So that when God looks at the believers, he's looking at Christ himself. Yeah. So the um so that's the um so how how do you think that the um the the Christian the Christian ethic kind of like almost how does that like restore the space time order and just you know ethics in general? Like what do you think it is that we're striving towards? What's this striving towards? Well, you're striving towards, uh, like, the post-millennial belief is that the Earth gets better and better. Mm -hmm. And uh, they believe in a gradual embetterment of the Earth. Yeah. So over time, it, they, they see history as a progression, maybe mm -hmm. not as a cycle. A lot, there's that disagreement between cyclical time and progressive time. But the po I, I think I am a post I haven't researched much into post-millennialism, but I think I am a post-millennialist. And then I think world's the world is evidently getting better. And even though, though there's, even though darkness will have its counter offensives and darkness will attack back and it's not a it's not a perfect triumphal march forward. There's withdrawals, there's retreats, but the victory of Christ over death has already completed. Mm -hmm. So he, when he rose from the dead, when he not only raised people in his ministry, three people I think it was he raised in his ministry, but then when he overcame death himself, it was the, on the cross. And he writes says on the cross, Christ. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was the darkness's best attack against the world. Mm -hmm. Was they thought they were defeating Christ in that moment, but Christ by resurrecting turned it against them and said, "Death has no claim over the Christian." 
And so having the earth restoration of space time, with the this comes through the Jewish faith, is that God comes to dwell amongst the people, Christ dwells amongst the people, then Christ brings it, the temple becomes the people. Yeah. The people are the temple. And they're also the ministers and priests, the high priests of God's New Test New Covenant. So by spreading it over the earth, by spreading the gospel over the earth, you're you're literally every believer you added to the church becomes a spreading of Christ's body. Yeah. And so that's where the Christ the, the Christ event or the the singularity comes in, mm -hmm. right? And you probably know you probably know quite a bit about singularity and stuff since yeah. you know that's your channel name. Yeah, it's interesting the um because this um and I know obviously N T Wright has the um had. I think he wrote like a like very long book about the case for the literal re resurrection. The of resurrection Jesus. of the Son of God. Yeah, I'm I'm still reading through that. Yeah, but yeah. the uh, but this connects almost to the I was reading a um, interpretation of the resurrection in the Baha'i faith as kind of figurative that the um, that in that on the third day that the, the that the cruciform theocracy is almost like inaugurated as Christ appears to the. Um, as Christ appears to the apostles, as Christ appears to the 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 five hundred, and that the uh, and that he he's been kind of almost like adding people to his body since in the um in the form of of the meek. Yeah, that's pretty much that's pretty much what I agree with that entirely. Yeah, that's pretty much yeah. what I was trying to say. Yeah. Uh, what was the so you got the dualism. We could talk about the philosophy, the dualisms of philosophy. We could talk about the singularity. You probably have a program for this. You've done so much background work for it. <laughs> Good on you, ambitious. Uh, I'm not. As, I'm more Europe. Like I said, more European. More work happens. So where are we? Heaven, Earth, restoration of space time. He's adding the meek. He's adding the body. He's building the body up. In in that moment, like I said, death and Satan tried to use death to conquer Christ, and Christ, by resurrecting, his victory was complete. And and actually, there's this, this belief that Christ appears in the middle of history. So there's what mm. there's like six thousand years of Jewish history, four thousand years of Jewish history, six thousand yeah. years of Jewish history before Christ comes in the world, mm -hmm. and then Christ comes in the middle of history. I don't believe we're in the end of times. There's mm -hmm. people since the Reformation have been saying we've been living in the end of times. I think we're what quarter way past the midpoint of history. Like you could say that two thousand years after midpoint of history. I'm not sure on that though. I don't have a lot of research to back that mm -hmm. up. But N.T. Wright beautifully says, masterfully says, that we need to be using twenty-first cent. We need to be using first-century answers for twenty-first-century questions. Yeah, we can't be the, like the Reformation debate versus the Catholics and the, the Protestants was that uh, you're using sixteenth-century questions against like an issue that was in the fourteenth century or the fifteenth century, sixteenth-century questions and answers. And then you get, and then beyond that, you're giving 19th century answers to that problem, that same problem set. 19th century answers to the problem set of Reformation versus Catholic, whereas we should be looking to the originary claims of the first century Christians, rather than and and then asking our own questions of them. And I said this in another article you may you may have read it, or uh, mm -hmm. I said that when a mo modern and postmodern author puts mm -hmm. in the labor, it's something yeah. of majesty. Because they they get all their ducks like N.T. Wright does this. He gets all his ducks in a row. Like for the case, the resurrection of the Son of God, for example, in that book, he he systematically goes through and says, well, there is a gospel accounts, which mm -hmm. if you don't believe that's the first hand accounts. There's the seeing of the five hundred that saw him resurrected. There's the spreading of the early church, and and people won't even want to talk to you about a sports team that they don't like, right? So imagine trying to convert them into Christianity, yeah. like that the spreading of the early church and the fact that all the apostles were martyred like violently. Yeah. All these together, the best e explanation for all the data is that yeah. the Christ event actually happened as described. Yeah, I, yeah, I find that. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not trying to push my religion on you in any way. I'm just using <laughs> the best explanation of the Christian. No, no, no. Pre preach the gospel, man. The um, but the um, <laughs> but the um, but I I find that too that the uh that the kind of postmodern writers that the that that when they're good they're like really good because the they kind of, they can integrate kind of the the pre both uh the scientific worldview 
with kind of the, the traditional yeah. worldview and that creates this interesting That's exactly system. they they master the scholarship of it. They master the evidence, like you're saying mm -hmm. the scientific method, so the scientific method being the induction induction of, of uh, evidence. Yeah. And whereas old scholars in the twentieth century, they still had their resources and stuff, but now we got things like the Dead Sea Scrolls where we can unravel it in three D like mm -hmm. You know, we can unravel these scrolls that you can't unravel physically because they disintegrate. You can take an image of them and unroll them in a computer. Yeah. We have stuff like that where we can go back to the first century and say, this is scientifically inductive of what we find here. And so N.T. Wright does it beautifully. I think Albert Schweitzer was quite good. Uh, and I have an issue against the evolutionary fetish. I call it the evolutionary fetish. I think that's the only, my only issue with Pearson. One, yeah. he won't confess he's a Christian. <laughs> two, 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 I thought not to criticize him as such, but one, he, this is what he says. He says, uh, it's cheap to say, I believe in God. That's what he says. Yeah. But this is to discount the whole fact that the history of the Reformation congregations was to elicit a confession of faith in front of a congregation. Yeah. Right. And, and, and back into the American colonies in the early, what, early 1700s, early, late, six, know, early 1600s, early 15, early 17th century. Mm -hmm. uh, it was enough for them that a person would c confess Christ in front of the congregation. Yeah. That was what en en enabled your membership into the congregation. So that's a whole tradition there that I think he's, he hasn't really considered. I don't think. Yeah. That the, um, that I think, I think I've, I've watched um, a lot of his stuff in the, I think he has kind of a, an understanding of the kind of psychological, um, you know, interpretation of, um, you know, of the of the Bible, he did a good series on the on the Genesis stories, but then is unable to kind of apply those to actually that they're pointing towards a real metaphysical truth. Yeah, the closest thing I th saw to him was that one where he's breaking down in tears, and he mm -hmm. said that Christ is the objective world and the normative world mm -hmm. mixed together, and he says he probably believes it. That that was that was I almost consider that a confession, but I think when he gets his scientific mind too ramped up it's like he doesn't he can't it'd be it's funny because if he read the work of nt right he'd probably be brought even closer to belief mm -hmm. but uh there's something about the scientific world that holds him back and that conf at least in that confession yeah although um although jung the um who's one of the um who is i think jordan peterson's like main influence or one of them is the uh, he said he he's famous for saying I don't I don't I don't think something like I don't think there's a God I know there I know there's God that the yeah. and the kind of the, theological certainty, um, but we'll we'll uh, we'll get to uh to Jordan Peterson later because sure. um, uh, you because there's a lot of good you did a a bunch of videos early early on on a lot of his um his work but the um but I'm interested because the um because N T Wright um from what I, from what I understand has kind of an emphasis on the um on resurrection both the bodily resurrection anastasis is what he calls it that's a i think the greek term for it yeah the resurrection of the body and he says it was just as unworldly or unfathomable to the greeks mm -hmm. and to the ancient the jews kind of had a, a kind of like a belief in the resurrection of the body yes. But they didn't have it fully fledged the way the Christians do, and they didn't think that it would happen at the mm -hmm. time in history that happened. They thought it would happen at the end of times. And uh, so when Christ resurrected, they didn't think that was possible at that point. But mm -hmm. then when that's the anastasis, and Christians believe that there will be a new Jerusalem on the earth mm -hmm. with a new resurrected body, you'll be clothed in white cloth, you'll be in the new Jerusalem, you'll be... And this is where I, I find it really interesting because I'm trying to stop the medieval percep conception of the church, where it's mm -hmm. like hell is this fire pit where people will what you'll you'll burn and your flesh will burn off, and then it'll regenerate and then it'll burn off again. Like like I think that's just I don't think that makes sense. I don't think the Bible even says that. Uh, there's parts where what does Jesus says? He says people will come from outside the kingdom to eat at the table of Abraham and Isaac. Mm -hmm. But the the wicked will be cast into the outer darkness. That yeah. makes it sound like there's a gradation. There's a kingdom in the center. There's new Jerusalem in the center, mm -hmm. and there's still a kingdom on the earth whereby there's an outer darkness to be sent to. Yeah, that's what it seems to me. I think that uh, the end and the, the resurrection isn't the end of history. It's like mm -hmm. a whole new beginning of history. Yeah, 
but the where do where do the wicked go? Do they get sent down to another dimension that's called hell that's a fiery pit, or do they do they continue they're they're resurrected, everybody's resurrected regardless. Yeah. But where are they sent afterwards? And that's the question that I think should be pursued by guys like N.T. Wright, or maybe we'll pursue it one day. Mm -hmm. Who knows? Yeah. So the uh, yeah, because it's interesting because the because both um, N.T. Wright and um, and Chris Langan both have kind of unor unorthodox or at least uh, views on um, or orthodox by the standards of yeah you know, by the standards of um, yeah. But unorthodox views on heaven and hell. I'm wondering, uh, as someone who's read both of those, that um, aside from the resurrection, what do you think about the, um, you know, he heaven and hell and the um, life after death? So uh, N.T. Wright put it the best. He said he was sitting in a church in the 16th chapel, or, or maybe not, might not the 16th chapel. I think it was actually that chapel, but, you know, in Italy, uh, in Rome, I think. And, uh, a Greek Orthodox was sitting beside him, and he, they looked at the painting of the the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark, Noah's Ark, mm -hmm. and they looked at the painting of Moses. And he says, "I get these two, but why? Why does it show Christ at the end, separating people into ones going to hell and ones going mm -hmm. to heaven, and they're dividing and they're forking off here, and one's a fiery pit? That's a Dante and medieval view of heaven and hell, mm -hmm. and it still pers it still persists." Even in my church, I saw their website that they think you'll be beamed up to heaven when you die, mm -hmm. or you'll be sent down to a fiery pit. I think that when you die, you're like Interact says, your soul may rest in paradise, mm -hmm. but you you still have a mission so that when you're resurrected, you're brought back to earth, the heaven to earth restoration, the new Jerusalem, the new resurrection. Yeah. You, you asked me what my thoughts of heaven and hell are. I don't believe it just doesn't make sense that a loving God mm -hmm. would create people. To damn yeah. them to eternal, like what your flesh, like I said, your flesh burns off, then it regenerates, and it burns off again. That is just what's the best word for that? It's sadistic, or it's, yeah. or it's, uh, it's almost ridiculous in its conception. But I do believe that there will be, will there be gnashing of the teeth? That's a common phrase mm -hmm. in the Bible, gnashing of the teeth. So people will realize they'll kneel, they'll kneel before Christ when they're resurrected. Mm -hmm. But then that's not the end of history. They'll be gnashing their teeth, realizing that they made such a mistake. But I think history continues, and I don't think those people are cast in a state of unbelief for the rest of eternity. Yeah, I think yeah. it's just my peculiar, my peculiar idiosyncratic beliefs that maybe have no basis anywhere else. But when it says the kingdom has the outer darkness, that means there's an outer darkness to be sent to. So there's the center of Jerusalem on the earth. There's a gradation, just like with any city or walled city or any uh, fortress, there's a gradation where people will be sent to the the medium outer limits of the city, the outer, outer limits, and the darkness. Like it's yeah. That's the way I, I think that could be researched with quite utility, quite a lot of utility. Yeah, because the, uh, well, because the, because Chris Lang in the, um, he had, um, that, it, it seems like he expresses almost like an uh, an annihilationist view that the um that if you're um not if you you lived in in such a way that you're um you weren't compatible with God God's telos that almost that it's not necessarily eternal torture but that your substance is just kind of you're that, just unbound and then you're kind of reinstantiated elsewhere in the universe. That could be very well because there are there are points where Jesus does use the, the sense of fire. Mm -hmm. But he doesn't mean it in eternal like the lake of fire is one thing that you sh that you might read about in Revelation. But there's no sense in which he uses fire where he says like you'll be the wheat separated from the chaff and the chaff will be thrown into the fire. And that means a quick burning up and a quick, and not like yeah. you're saying annihilation of the substance of the person. So there could be backing for that. It could be that Christ just has like the wicked tree with no fruit has no use for it, cast in the fire. But there's, there's different biblical phrases, right? Like when I say cast into the outer darkness, mm -hmm. I think that's a, a eschatology of, of a certain way the kingdom sent, it could be that when if you are wicked, not just an unbeliever, mm -hmm. but wicked, you yeah. are burned up in in an instant and never you seen again, or, or recon like you're saying reconstitute somewhere else. But it's a mystery. I think that's the mysterious part of the mysterious aspect of faith. Like we don't know what yeah what will be held. There's hints at it, but and I'm not a I'm not a universalist either. Mm -hmm. That should be noted too because I yeah. think. Like my own parents don't believe, 
aren't believers. Uh, I was, mm-hmm. I grew up atheist and I had a yeah. inflection point in my life where I became a uh, Christian. I started out as a Catholic and then I moved over to, I'm part of a Baptist church now, but mm-hmm. yeah, it's uh, interesting. I think the medieval conception of heaven and hell is completely off. Yeah. And I think yeah. since Dante, it's been, it's been, like, why did the reformers keep that when they discarded so much else about the Catholic Church, right? And then even the 19th century liberal Protestants were even more staunch in, in supporting that claim that there's a heaven and a hell. Yeah. I check this box, go here. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Now I made, uh, yeah, any, uh, stick with your program here, so. Oh, no, I don't, I don't have, I don't have any. Oh, no? Or right, I, 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 have some, I have some notes, but the, okay. um. Or sometimes organic's the best, you know. Sometimes. Yeah, but no, no. The uh, or did you have anything? Yeah, I was gonna say. Uh, what was I gonna say? Uh, so there's a there's a the medieval conception of Reformation conception, and then they check the box and they go here. They check the box. They go there. Uh, but it's 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 just, it's there's no biblical i think i think i looked through the bible and tried to find a basis for i think that more often christ uses the term fire in terms of that, that annihilation we're speaking of and uh i think the new jerusalem will come down the resurrection of the body the believer okay so here's here's a, here's the thing for you uh the book of life in revelation it says those not written in the book of life will be cast into a lake of fire yeah uh is this book of life? I've I've read other by Doug Wilson's account of of Revelation, and he says that the book of life has to be a covenantal book, meaning it's not the book of the elect, because they talk about names they can blot out names. Yeah. And if it was an elect, the idea is that if you're elect, you can never be blotted out. So it has to be a book of the covenant, because in the book of the covenant, if you don't want to pull your end of the covenant, then you can't be blotted out. Yeah. So the book of life is that way. And then it says, uh, it says Satan and the, I think Satan and death will be cast into a lake of fire. Yeah. Uh, but again, there's no evidence that when they say lake of fire, there's a dimension called hell will you be, you'll be burning over and over again. It could be that it's just a fire that engulfs you instantly, annihilates you, so on and so on. Uh, we could get to dualisms in philosophy. And here's a brilliant, a brilliant thing on Chris Lang and on the CTMU yeah. that I think I, mean, I was talking to a guy that wanted to call me, and we we're talking about how Lang often draws a circle around things, mm-hmm. and then says that language extends over the subtends the circle. Yeah. So what with uh, with self intrinsic self determinacy, for example. Yeah. We we're talking about how Chris Lang borrows language from cybernetics, mm-hmm. and there's nodal points, and synthetic operators are nodal points. And that intrinsic self determinacy doesn't necessarily apply to one individual, but implies the whole system at once. Mm-hmm. So what happens is Langan draws a circle around the nodal points and he says there's intrinsic self determinacy in between and amongst and in between the syntactic operators. Yeah, that, that could almost be something like the Holy Spirit, you know. Yeah, that the mapping between the you know I'm a particular inst- instantiation in reality and then the global reality which is god and then that yeah that it in between those and it and i think in some sense that that's kind of the the christian that the that the holy spirit is almost like the mapping between jesus which who represents all of creation you know the nicene creed says you know the whole world is is made through him and the um and, and then through and then god so that's interesting so what do you what do you think is the um what do you think are the are the problems with um with dualism and how do you think the CTMU solves those? So I think with dualism, especially with Rene Descartes, but it, it mm-hmm. was before him and he just made it. I'm reading Heidegger right now, Being in Time, and he does a beautiful yeah. job of saying we talk about cog uh what, what is it cogito eager something sum cogito something like n sum or something like that. There you go. We talk about cogito, mm-hmm. which is a subject, but we yeah. don't talk about the sum, which is a world. Yeah, we put the, we the only part that the legacy of Descartes is this cogito, but it really is the subject-object dualism. And what Langan says with his language, he says that our philosophical systems, our language, this is my interpretation of Langan. Uh, yeah. The dualisms, let's say they're they're part of the same superset. 
we draw a circle around them because they're in the same they're on the reality plane or the morality medium yeah. or the, what do you want to call, whatever you want to call it or this mathematical superset and then our language extends over those dualisms so with scripture and there, there may be a denial of scripture on the basis of oh i don't think believe it actually happened yada yada but there may be a more radical dualism running down the center of scripture where we say uh the subject object divide takes place in scripture and therefore we can't make any like there, like when you talk about subject and object then there's no way of proving that the world exists yeah there's no way of proving that the subject exists yeah you you or, or that they can't exist together or that if they do exist they might just exist in the mind mm -hmm. but as heidegger said um there's a more fundamental ontological concept whereby with dasein it's the spirit of being i mean mm -hmm. I'm, I'm begging the heidegger too is is one of my He's probably my favorite historical philosopher, right. uh, but I'm reading his being time the good the good translation right now, and it says, "Care is the fundamental ontological essence of Dasein or truth of Dasein, mm -hmm. and everything can be reducible to care." With philosophers like Descartes that were partaking of dualisms, they could never have a proof good enough. Immanuel Kant tried it. Immanuel Kant tried it. Mm -hmm. They can never have a proof good enough that would prove that there's a world outside of the mind. Yeah. Uh, so with dualisms, you can't. You're kind of. It's a skeptical. It produces skepticism. It produces this idea that you cannot prove. Uh, you cannot prove the world exists outside of yourself. You cannot prove. You can barely prove that you exist. You're left with a little scrap that the cogito mm -hmm. is like that small. And uh, more generally, there with dualisms, I think what dualism eventually breeds, even though I can't, I can't draw the connection between the two, is that people say, well, scripture didn't actually happen, or it happened so long ago, it, didn't, it doesn't have an effect mm -hmm. on me. The Jewish history has no effect on yeah. me. Uh, it was just some primordial event that probably didn't happen. There's this denial. I think dualism breeds that. I think dualism breeds that, that fundamental denial of scripture. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's um. I know um. P Peterson said in his um, a clip from his, his Exodus um series on the Daily Wires that the um, that the he was, or it was about I think the historicity of the Exodus from Egypt and he and he said you know that that's that it's not that it might be something which happened in the distant past but it's also something which continues to happen that there's this oh. continual you know flight flight from Egypt you know. Um, from tyranny. Um, yeah. I think Jonathan Paggio said in an interview they're having with Pearson beside him, and I love Paggio, it's great. He said there's no, the Bible isn't provable forensically. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I agree with that. I think that N.T. Wright proves at least the resurrection forensically. Like, uh, for example, people say, well, there's no, what, what are these gospel accounts actually? Well, you believe in Alexander the Great, don't you? There's about 20 times more evidence for Jesus as there is was what is historical evidence. It's written firsthand gospel like accounts uh, with people writing in the first century. People around them knew that this was the person writing the gospel. They knew from the style. They knew from words hearsay and around the church. Uh, so there is, for, I believe, with at least with Jesus, I, I could probably extend that over the Jew the Old Testament as well. I could probably say that there's forensic evidence of the events that I, I'm a creationist. And I also believe that the events, of the old Testament actually happened, that they actually transpired. It's not just a psychological happening. Like that's where I disagree with Peterson is. I think that, for example, with the book of Daniel, mm -hmm. we're, we're finding out about the Babylonian Kings th forensically by a firsthand account. And that wouldn't, that, that forensic evidence of that king would never have existed if it weren't for Dan the book of Daniel being written. Yeah. Uh, and I think that it, and, and then there's a question of, well, if I believe in a triune God, if I believe Christ was resurrected, yeah. why would I limit my belief to just what the scientific paradigms agree on today? Like they agree on evolution, mm -hmm. which I think there's an evolution fetish. So I could, we could get into that. Uh, but it's like my uncle said to me, he's like, well, I don't believe uh, a guy named Jesus walked around in the first century. I believe that the spirit of God came down. I said, w why can't you believe that if you believe the spirit of God came down, what's the stretch of the imagination that comes in to believe that Jesus was incarnated? Yeah. You know, You're, you, you start, you, first of all, I think most science today is, is, is bankrupt. Yeah. I think it truly is bankrupt. I think that 
I like the CTMU because for its epistemic and metaphysical cert, not cert, well, you could say certainty, epistemic and metaphysical properties that it brings into the, the equation. Uh, but I, I, I think, I guess N.T. Wright does say that it takes a le- it still takes a leap of faith to believe mm-hmm. these things. But once you're inside of that belief, you, you find that most truth is rooted in the Bible. And yeah. most, uh, like I was looking, like even my dad said, oh, well, Na- what about Neanderthals? And one of my people in my church said, Neanderthals never existed. Mm-hmm. And I, I looked it up, and the best existing Neanderthal skeleton is called Amud 1, A-M-U-D-1. And they have a fragment of a skull like this big. And mm-hmm. there's two experts that disagree that it can even be proven it's a Neanderthal bone. Mm-hmm. And there's a great website called Answers in Genesis that talks about how if there was such thing as evolution, we could observe instances of animals today gaining new properties, like a dog gaining wings or something mm-hmm. like that. But the fact that when you're born, you you inherit the genes from your parents, one gene from each parent, one half your genes from each parent. And so a dog, even though we have dog breeding, we can get like 150 different breeds of dog, but none of them have wings. The same way Darwin said that a bear going into the ocean becomes a whale. You can't, where can you observe that instance of that happening? Where's the in-between? Where's the missing link? Where's the, you know, uh, Yeah. It's like a fish can't grow lungs. A dog can't grow wings. Uh, a bear probably can't grow to be a whale. It's it has a gene pool. There's a there's a gene set, a gene pool that, from which its parents that inherits. So and I haven't proven anything conclusively in my mind this way, but yeah. uh, I think I've I've kind of I'm now siding on the side of the biblical truth is real. And if God could create the universe, he wouldn't need evolution to create it. Mm-hmm. He could just create it ex, ex- nihilo, or I think it's called, just out of nothing. Like, yeah. So the uh, uh, so so you think you think that it's uh, all all the way back, including you know the uh, the Genesis stories, you know Adam and Eve, Abraham, etc. Yes, I believe they're they're true. the the only The only thing I'm shaking on that is yeah. there's this guy named Michael Heiser, I think, yeah. isn't it, or Heisner, that talks about the. Uh, the unseen realm of the Bible. They talking about there was giants in the past. Yeah. And I don't, I don't know. I, I think if, if it's written in the Bible, it has to be true. I don't know if what his interpretation is true, but it's an interesting vein to pursue. Were there giants back then? Were there Nephilim? Were there, yeah. when he's, when God's talking about creation, he's talking about with the counts of other gods around him. So there's angels, but I do think that heaven and hell take place on earth. So yeah. in, Revel- in the book of revelation, they're mm-hmm. talking about events in heaven. But it yeah. actually transpires on Earth. Like they say that the beast was Nero. Nero was the beast. They can prove that through the number 666. Yeah. That the number, that was something with Nero's name came up to 666. Or, uh, and even with the book of Daniel, they're talking about the goat that would conquer the world. There's this goat that was going around. That was Alexander the Great that mm-hmm. was doing that. Uh, so there, there's, there's, I believe there's a dimension of heaven and a dimension of yeah. like the demon dimension. Uh, but I think it transpires on the Earth. That's what yeah. I think. Yeah. Yeah. So, do you do you think that that's at all at all with the um with um Chris Langan's view? Because I know that the um the Substack that um it for I think Doctor Doctor Gina Langan is called te- teleologic evolution. That the um that <laughs> well not well natural selection is real. Yeah. Uh, evolution. That's a tough sell for me because, like I said, like mm-hmm. where's the examples of dogs with wings? Or we can breed any dog we want. Yeah. Couldn't breeders bring up bring up like splice wings into a dog's DNA or something? Or, or couldn't wouldn't we see an instance of it in nature in the current times? And like, like they said, this guy was a geneticist. He says actually geneticists don't really believe too much in evolution. The ones that are serious are Christian. Yeah, because you have a gene pool when you're born. Each population has is there's different individuals in the population, but that individual is born with a gene pool. There's a certain number of traits that can express. Mm-hmm. I can't be born with gills. There's no in between, and there's no in between between the the, be, the vestigial beginnings of a gill that can be born mm-hmm. into me. There may be cow. There, every every instance of evolution is obviously uh, is usually a really bad birth defect. Yeah. 
Like it's a really so. Uh, I think a lot of these boomers they believe in they believe in the they don't take their belief radically enough. They mm. they and that's that's part of the the pull of liberalism in man, right? Yeah. Is that you you want to be generous to other people's beliefs? You want to be generous to the scientific paradigms. But if if you're and I'm not saying to be hard or be a hardliner, yeah. but just be radical in your belief and just say you know what I uh, I think the Bible the creationist account is correct. I believe mm-hmm. events in Genesis happen. I believe that a document such as the Bible, like Pearson likes to say this, couldn't have emerged out of nothing. Couldn't have been yeah. written like a Shakespeare. Sam Harris said, "Well, it's just a committee of Shakespeare's." And that's where it gets Pearson, by the way. He gets <laughs> Pearson by saying, "Well, to you, it's just a committee of Shakespeare's writing the Bible." But yeah. no, these these books, like Pearson says, no, these stories he couldn't he couldn't defend against that because he's still within the scientific belief. But within, you believe the Bible is true, and it couldn't have emerged as a document in history yeah. without also being backed up by a monotheistic God. Yeah, well, I agree with that. That the um, that the Bible and the prophets and the writings are all um, you know divine divine re- revelation. The um, when did you like um become become a Christian? Because you said that your uh, your parents are atheists. Your first video is um the moral la- was on the moral landscape by Sam Harris. Yeah, yeah. So when did that like change? So uh, it happened. I believed in God in 2014. So I was had a mm-hmm. bad mushroom trip. <laughs> and uh that will make you believe in some that will make you believe and uh uh-huh. and then from there that i believe i admitted god was real it felt like he was crushing me under his heel like mm. i had that hallucination day he was crushing me under his heel and that's pretty damning that's pretty scary uh i was a bad trip it wasn't a it wasn't a good trip <laughs> uh but but it made me believe in it and i thought there's something to this there's there is a presence there and then uh I mean, three years, four years later, five years later, my aunt brought me into the Catholic Church. I went through RCAA, and then I moved back to my near my hometown after my university days. Uh, I'm in Ontario. I was living in London, Ontario, for my university days. I was born in a small border town called Wallsburg, mm-hmm. and now I live in a, Ch- a town like 30 minutes away called Chatham. Mm-hmm. Uh, but moving back to Chatham, I got. I met a guy that was part of this Protestant church and he seemed, he's really stable, really friendly, very mature. So I thought I'm going to be the Catholic church to me. I went there a couple of times in Chatham here in a small town and it's just all old people. It's just old, mm-hmm. like septuagenarians, like 70 years old. And the service is dull and it's a guy that can't speak English very well. And he, and uh, the, the priest just, they do the thing and, I just, there was no magic to it. And then I went to one Protestant, I went to this Baptist church and they took off their masks, by the way. They took mm-hmm. off their masks and I was like, I like this place. This is, this <laughs> yeah, is good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is a good sign. And the preacher was just, just phenomenal. Uh, uh, it's, Maple, it's Maple City Baptist Church is uh, is my church. And Rick Dressler is the pastor and he can deliver a sermon like it may you you have to agree with him by, by the time he ends the sermon, and uh, so that was a year year and a half, almost two years ago. And so uh, yeah, I had and I was baptized as an adult in, uh, last June. Mm-hmm. So I had my little confession that I had in front of the congregation. So it was good. Yeah, that's been so it's been since 2014. I've been. Yeah. First confessional belief of God, and then my confession of Christ came with the Catholic Church back three, four years ago, and then my confession in front of the Congregation of Reformation Congregation was this past June. So yeah, yeah, that's what I've uh, that's what I've kind of heard about the um, you know, about psychedelics is that the you almost have like an apprehension of you know truth, but you're not necessarily mature enough to actually that if you yeah. have like you know studied and um. And you know, done you know, religious ri- ritual and whatnot. That you're not not necessarily capable of getting of of understanding that in a mature way. It's an uh, inco uh sort of belief that you you end up with. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a good way to put it. Like I saw this. I was watching a, the psychedelic experiments that conduct on people, and people were saying they thought they were an elastic band. Mm-hmm. And they thought that they were an elastic band. <laughs> Uh, but the the idea that your whole brain it's kind of like the limitless drug where your whole brain lights up and you're making associations that are mm-hmm. from across the whole neural network. 
And uh, yeah, it was. There's more things that happened to me in between them, but that's just what I'll say for purposes of the interview. Yeah. So the um. So that's the um. A big part of the um. The CTMU is about kind of the connection between mind and reality. So how does that, which kind of, I guess, kind of blurs that distinction? How do you think that helped in kind of your eventual understanding of these concepts? It was almost like a revelation, and revelation mm-hmm. means. Unva- like I uh, know, no apocalypse means unveiling. Revelation kind of means the same thing, like a disclosedness of reality. Uh, it was a. Pr- I felt a presence. First of all, I thought that I was a Brian Cranston turtle. I thought that I was Brian Cranston as a turtle, and I was curled up in a ball on the floor, and I felt like God was crushing me. It's pretty horrible. It's a horrifying like, experience. Before that, I thought that I was a. a limit of one hour oh we have a 10 minutes i guess free group calls have a limit of one hour oh we can do this again if you want to put the two videos together and keep going uh but yeah i'll just keep going uh yeah i before i was laying on the couch watching like american idol or like an ad for um, uh american idol or america's got talent and i thought that i was a christian woman like i thought i was a 57 year old christian woman and that so and i'll and uh I'll just leave it at that. For there's more things that happened to me in between there, and my university days were tough days for me. I had cultural yeah. shock. I moved away from my small town to a larger city, a university. I lived alone, and uh, is 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 a lot of suffering. But I yeah. think young men suffer quite a bit. Yeah. And society views young men as expendable. Mm-hmm. They they don't care, give a shit about you. Like. <laughs> <laughs> like they think you're dumb and maybe maybe you are dumb but yeah uh as you approach 30 i've been watching a lot of guys on youtube like the male advantage to talk about how men hit 30 mm-hmm. and they start to that's i think 30 is a good age because you look at martin luther jesus uh yeah you know, like all these great speakers started to get really articulate at 30 yeah that's when their their verbal iq their crystallized intelligence, their verbal IQ, and their fluid IQ was still relatively high from 18. It peaks at 18, but at 30, it's still relatively high. Uh, but their crystallized, they started to be able to contend with the older gentlemen in their life. They started to be able to contend competitively verbally at, with verbal IQ. Yeah. But yeah. So I, I think the, the male advantage is that as you, the best peak for men, I think men peak between 30 and 55. Mm-hmm. Even the sixty or sixty-five, if they take care of themselves. But, yeah. yeah. So the, so the um, you you listed um, I'll I'll get to the um, uh, Jordan, you listed um Jordan Peterson as one of your main influences. So yeah. what what do you think it is about the you talked about kind of the um, the, the silent suffering of you know um of men in particular. So what do you think it is about his philosophy which appeals to so many people? He's a, he's a prophet. He's mm-hmm. a prophet. Yeah. Uh, he he tells young men, and young men, I had a good father figure, mm-hmm. but I still benefit from Jordan Pearson. Yeah, men without a father figure would probably benefit even more from Jordan Pearson. Mm-hmm. It's it's the what does he call it in his in his uh, talk at called Logos at Ephesus. He talks about. Logos being perception, we see things, we see objects as perceptual patterns. Yeah. Then there's a hierarchy of value and a privileging of attention. And then there's two spirits. There's the spirit of Christ, that yeah. is the son that articulates the goodness of creation is at the py- pinnacle of the pyramid. Then there's the spirit of God, the father, who calls you out of your tent, calls you out of the mm-hmm. desert. Yeah. So for Pierce, I mean, he's relaying, relaying these deep religious messages. And it's, the, it's literally the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Mm-hmm. That that's what that's what hits young men is like they see him talk and he's art- and it adds it helps that he's an older gentleman he's mm-hmm. like a father figure and yeah. he's very articulate and he's he's in he says he's an agreeable person he and I'm an agree I'm a highly agreeable person too but he's not afraid to stand up for things yeah he's not afraid to say this is the line in the sand and I will articulate the defense here I think he's the well being the biggest public intellectual in the world right now he is. Mm-hmm. Occupying that place in the pyramid at the top, yeah, that articulates the wisdom of Western civilization, the Judeo Judeo Christian West. Yeah, 
And if you if if that doesn't resonate with you, I don't know who you are. <laughs> you know, like I don't know what if you know. Maybe you're maybe you're a radical feminist or something, but uh, if it doesn't touch, and I, he, I've cried watching him before. I've cried mm-hmm. like I've, I've broken up because he says, "You're not nothing. You can lift your load from here to there. You're not nothing." And I was like, "Oh man!" And he, he was getting emotional, and I was getting emotional, and it was, yeah, yeah. No, there was a there was a good um good video. It was the um it was him it it was an interview, and he says, "You know, you it, it's not it's not okay." To be it's necessary. It's necessary to be a man. I think it was another one where he said it's necessary to be a man. Yeah. Someone says, What do you what do you say to young men? It's like, it's not okay, it's necessary. Yeah. Look at these men, they're building the they're in the sewers, they're building skyscrapers, they're they're clearing the roads, they're they're doing the garbage, like yeah. yeah I so- get into a lot of the uh I don't know if you know the the compilations like the embrace masculinity. Mm-hmm. Uh, reject modernity, embrace masculinity. It's a, oh, after I've the seen song. Those. It's like all like the gym bros. <laughs> yeah, I get into those quite a bit. You'll notice that Chris Lang and two is a gym bro. Yeah, he is. Uh, he has a. He said he had like a overhead press of like some some insane numbers, like three military press of like three hundred or something. Because it will give you more energy mm-hmm. and it will make your fluid IQ. Di- I've been getting into weights myself. I was pretty lazy. Mm-hmm. I got a kidney stone this past year that made me like really. The guy said it's from general ill health. You're yeah. overweight. It's from general ill health. So I mm-hmm. said, I got I to do something about this. Yeah. And I feel great. Like I've been doing weights and push ups mm-hmm. and shit. And uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, exercise. I say do resistance training. Like Pearson's, Pearson says this too do, re- do resistance training and you'll you'll do better over time. Yeah. Well, uh, the the call, call ends in five minutes. So if you could just like, um, I'll tell you when, just like log on and log off. It automatically sends the recording to me so will you send it to my email no it will send the, it sends the recording to me and then the uh and then i can just like edit the two together okay yeah yep. so the, um because there, there's a, a little bit more not too, not too much but the um so on a, as a as a canadian the um what what are your thoughts on a lot of the um the, th- the things that he's talked about the like trudeau the bill c16 the freedom convoy the kind of like climate um things with um uh, over there, the um, what? So what? What do you think about those? The biggest thing is to me, mm-hmm. and this is the thing that's not talked about, is that Trudeau has just banned every semi-auto rifle mm-hmm. with a detachable magazine. Yeah. And I'm a, I'm even though I don't partake, I'm a big believer in the Second Amendment. Mm-hmm. I think it's the iron fence around the the rights that exist in the garden of the free speech, freedom of conscience. Yeah. The Second Amendment is the iron fence. Yeah. Uh, and Trudeau has taken away. You can conduct guerrilla warfare with a bolt action rifle, mm-hmm. but uh, I believe that military par small arms are essential to. Uh, I say military par small arms, whatever the military yeah. has, we have a, some c- civilian copy of it. Uh, mm-hmm. And in Canada, people don't know this, but you can, you could, before Trudeau came in, you could get an AR 15. Mm-hmm. You could get a t- Tavor, you could get any, an SKS, you could get a. It's like basically an AK 47. An SKS is basically an AK 47. And uh, Trudeau is taking that away. He doesn't have a program that he can pass it to buy back the guns, mm-hmm. but he is trying to. He did ban them by an order, executive order. So now you can't even take it out of your safe. Yeah, uh, and I think that's that's the first on the road. And uh, I was even writing the apocalyptic novel where I said that like the future of America is that it'll be. Uh, it won't be that the federal government gets too strong. It'll be that it gets too weak, like in Mexico. Mm-hmm. I think that's the the biggest threat to. It's not that the federal government gets over and over powerful. It's that it implodes, collapses, mm-hmm. and then something like gangs take over, cr- criminal enterprises take over. Yeah, and then you have it so that civilians, if they don't have arms, they can't defend themselves against. They like the whole idea of the Second Amendment is that you can get together with your neighbors and band together and form a militia. And I believe that's important in Canada. Maybe we haven't had the right rat solidified into our existence, but we had something of a gun culture in this country. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I think uh, it's a crime. That's the number one thing he's going after. And uh, just so many other things, like when he tweeted against the, the Freedom Convoy, he said they're mm-hmm. misogynist, racist, xenophobic. <laughs> it, like he used every slur, liberal <laughs> slur possible in one tweet. It's like, yeah. whoa, hold back, just like, you, like sit, parse it out, save it, like spread it out over a lot. Eh? Uh, <laughs> and then the vaccine. Then as you know, the vaccine. I got two vaccines, but 
mm-hmm. I didn't get a, I didn't get the booster afterwards just because I thought nah it's free to me uh, maybe maybe it'll lessen my COVID I'm not I'm not a militant I'm not like oh if you get a vaccine you're a piece of garbage or mm-hmm. or oh if you uh, don't get it if you don't get a vaccine like where's the moderation in the discourse you know yeah and uh, I hope I think Canada's politics what you see is that it's is the Lorian, it's called the Laurentian Consensus. It's kind of like the same in the States. The corridor between Toronto and Montreal controls the whole country. They have the most seats in Parliament partitioned and calls about to end. But the, uh, but the uh, it was just Trudeau or Biden. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, the, the thing about Trudeau is he can, he can mess up Canada. Yeah. And that's all fine. We're only 30 million people. But Biden is responsible for now two the World War Three coming into effect. So what's yeah. worse, Biden is way worse by mm-hmm. scale of what the problem is. Yeah, his, his, his State of the Union's tonight. Like uh, the China, like, why were the why would the Chinese send a balloon? Like why would they do? What? Oh, I, I don't, I don't, know, I don't know do what that? they do with that. The um, because they had like the um. Cause like I don't get what what like the point is like I I don't I, I don't know what the end game have, is like why don't I you assume, just send a regular spy plane over like why does it have to be a balloon Yeah like I assume they have like drones or like stealth yeah. like satellites or whatever. like with the like, Americans in the sixties they were sending like those what the B two the B two like spy planes over the Blackbird like supersonic jets like why like the Japanese did the same weird shit in World War Two where they sent bombs by a balloon. What's it's just it's just weird to me. I don't understand yeah. it. Yeah, no, I, it it almost felt like they were just like taunting us. Like it's 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 on purpose. It's deliberate. It's like okay, shoot us down. Now we can invade Taiwan or something. I don't yeah. know. Yeah, the um, yeah, I don't, I don't they're, know. they're saying they're saying now that we're culpable for shooting it down. <laughs> like yeah, it's no, it, perverse yeah. Chinese finger, like finger torture. It's something perverse. Yeah, no, I saw the uh, one of the things. It was the um, that that one of the Chinese officials accused the U.S. of human rights violations for yeah. shooting it down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's a really good guy for the if you want to talk about the Russia. I don't know if you want to talk about Russia Ukraine. Oh uh, yeah, that was actually next up. The um... okay, there's a really good guy that people should watch. I I have a quite an understanding of Russian history. I've read it all through my university mm-hmm. days about the Bolshevik revolution. I, I've read like five biographies on Stalin. Mm-hmm. Uh, but John Mearsheimer, I think his name is John Mearsheimer. He says, P- people believe Putin is an imperialist. Mm-hmm. And so from there they say, well, he's trying to incorporate Ukraine into Russia. And then there's a nut- they, then he'll try to incorporate Eastern Europe. He'll start going one country after another. Yeah. But he invaded Ukraine with 190,000 troops. Mm-hmm. When the Germans invaded Poland, they used 1.5 million troops of the Wehrmacht. Yeah. It takes to conquer a people, to incorporate and occupy a country of 40 million to 60 million people. I'm not sure what, what Ukraine's population but it's between there. Uh, yeah. You need an army of like several million. Mm-hmm. So it makes more sense that uh, the Russians, to them, they're not imperialists trying to take over a, a, a new greater Russia. Mm-hmm. They're actually, uh, Mearsheimer says this, he says, in, in 1999, they, we tried to incorporate Ukraine into NATO, and they screamed bloody murder. Yeah. In 2004, the Orange Revolution happened. We tried to overthrow, we overthrew the Ukrainian government. Then they screamed bloody murder. In 2008, we did the same thing in Ukraine and again in Georgia. They invaded Georgia. Mm-hmm. It's a red line. It's the reddest of all red lines in the sand. Yeah. And they've been they've said the Russians. Doesn't matter what we believe. The Russians believe that Ukraine is the existential threat to their existence. Mm-hmm. If we incorporate them into NATO, then you then Russia can't act because if you attack one member, one member of NATO, the whole NATO goes to war with you. So incorporating Russia or uh, Ukraine into NATO and the EU, uh, like I'm for Ukrainian sovereignty, mm-hmm. but it's I think that there's a useful concept from World War II that you should use is that countries in World War II had spheres of influence. Yeah. So Russia had the Balk like the Balkans in Eastern Europe, Britain had Greece and and. Uh, and their colonies, uh, the U.S. started to have its own interest in Western Europe. And when the Russians view, and like Mearsheimer says, we're pursuing a clear-cut victory against Russia because we think we can defeat them because we think they're weak. Mm-hmm. But to Russia, this is a do-or-die conflict. It's an existential threat. They have to have a victory, otherwise they're not gonna they're not gonna stop. 
and yeah. they and even though they won't engage probably in absolute thermonuclear war against us, Ukraine doesn't have any nuclear weapons. They could use localized bombs in Ukraine if yeah. they wanted to. So, it's, yeah, the, yeah. But isn't there like the um? Because your um, I believe is it your your second most popular video on your um channel is about the fourth political theory. Yeah. by Dugan. Isn't there isn't it there like an imperialist philosophy underlying it of this kind of like Eurasianism that Russia would I call use? it imperialist or would I call it uh, an alternative to American imperialism? Mm-hmm. So it is a philosophy that's trying to incorporate multi- the BRIC countries, Brazil, Russia, India, China. It's it's an alternative philosophy to liberalism. Mm-hmm. So just because you have an alternative to liberalism doesn't mean that you want to conquer country after country. It oh, means yeah. that you're you're trying to spread towards a multipolar world, and we're becoming a multipolar world. That's mm-hmm. happened. Like the the U.S. with Biden will no longer be a unipol. Uh, is Dugan an imperialist? I think he would say that Dugan himself would say that imperialism is racist. Mm-hmm. He would say that he wouldn't. He would. He says yeah. that there's ethnoses that have distinct values, and I would mm-hmm. call them nations, but he calls them ethnoses, and then civilizations and, and religions are narods. Yeah. But he, he would. He's anti-imperialist. He's trying to articulate an alternative vision than liberalism. Okay. That's that's all. I, that's uh. So it's not that he's that he wants to you know annex all the Eastern Bloc countries. It's that it's almost like a coherent ideological force against the against yeah. the kind of excesses of the world. And he, he wouldn't even call it an ideology, I don't think. He would call it okay. a philosophy that's uh like I think uh he would call liberalism I guess he does call it an ideology, but his definition of ideology isn't the is the corrupted version that we think of when we think yeah. of ideology. He's thinking of it as a, a system of thought that can oppose liberalism as an alternative, as a viable alternative for countries like Brazil, Russia, India, China. Right? The BRIC mm-hmm. countries. And he has books called Towards the Multipolar, like Multipolarity, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. It, yeah, we, we in the West, and it's a democratic bias. Like, look how badly they went after Trump for this Russia collusion. They have a fetish where they're like the Russians are the, yeah. the satanic force on the world. And uh, I don't know. I, I speak a little bit of Russian, like not very well. I couldn't hold the conversation. But mm-hmm. uh, reading Russian history, you realize that the Russians – the Russians have saved Europe twice. Yeah. Once against Napoleon, once against Hitler. I, I I feel that I wish Trump was in power and that he made a pact with Russia and that Russia would back out of Ukraine. We'd back mm-hmm. off and we'd back off of our NATO prerogative yeah. and they they return back home. Although there's so many bodies now that there's not going to be a well, first of all, there's not going to be a diplomatic solution to this war because we're both no. we're both pursuing clear cut victory against the other. Yeah, uh, and they've killed enough people and enough civilians that the Ukrainians aren't going to forget this. There's going to be terrorist attacks yeah, in Russia right. for years to come. Uh, yes, yeah, but I feel like Mersheimer said that uh, we've been leading Ukraine down the primrose path. Mm-hmm. We've been saying you can join NATO, you can join the EU. It's all going to be okay. You're going to be a Western de- liberal democracy, and mm-hmm. for Russian, the Russian. Well, you don't understand. But the Russians came out of Ukraine. They're ancient. Ancient Russia was called Kievan Rus. Yeah. It was, they came out of Kiev and, and that's where Russians came from. Uh, it's like, it's like saying, uh, 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 England's going to be the, it's like when the Normans were taking over England, like England was the Angles, the Jutes, and the Saxons. Those were the Germanic tribes that were in England. Mm-hmm. I guess the Normans were Germanic too, but because the Franks were Germanic and the Northmen were Germanic, but. I'm trying to find a good parallel to where's I don't know any other example of history where uh, the the mother country mm-hmm. is being invaded by its offspring. It's like yeah. some myth. It's like some mythology. <laughs> it's like the Tiamat thing. It's like the 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 goddess Tiamat gives birth to all these gods like Marta, like all these secondary gods, mm-hmm. and then they have to fight their mother. Only yeah. in this instance, U- Ukraine is an evil mother. It's just it's actually been a been a, a, a good mother, but. It's, it's hard. I'm trying to find parallels. I don't know if I can find any. Yeah. So, you, so you think that the, um, that the, that the kind of wet West and America in particular has kind of been, been, been egging Russia on throughout the last few decades. Well, it's, it's a specific policy that they've been pursuing that, 
we've been doing this because we think Russia is weak. We think we can get a leg up on them. Mm-hmm. And if we could, and if we, it's like in the Cuban missile crisis, uh, the, the Russians were trying to put missiles in Cuba, but the Americans had already put missiles in Turkey. Yeah. So the Russians were trying to find a counterbalance that would counterbalance the power. And the good example, I think Zizek says this quite aptly, he says, in mm-hmm. Star Wars, the Republic becomes the Empire. Yeah. America is a Republic that when it's left to its elitist leaders, they be, they, may, they become globalists and they become the, the Empire. So to us, America's all good, and we, we and there's a good there's a good debate between uh, Dugan and this Brazilian thinker. I forget his name, mm-hmm. but the Brazilian thinker said actually, rural America is the authentic ethnos of America. Yeah, and in Russia, they have an authentic ethnos of the Russian people. They call it the data sign of the Russian people. Mm-hmm. We have an effect an effective data sign of the American people, but it's the elites. It's the and I'm watching Andrew Tate, so I'm getting into the Matrix talk, <laughs> elite stuff. He's convincing. He's very convincing. I like him. Uh, but he's like, no, you're in the Matrix, the, the elites. And it's just Charles Murray described this in his book, Coming Apart, where he says, since Harvard, since the SAT sorting system, uh, there's been a eugenics movement in the states. Yeah. Where the small towns like why where, where I came from, Wallsburg, it's all it was all it's all rust it's like a rust belt town. It's like all burnt mm-hmm. out. Uh and it's been eugenics. They now work with the, they now go to school and it's like a daycare the school's like a daycare where you, yeah. you hook up with, with somebody. And uh what was I gonna say? Yeah, the elite it's it's been okay, so here's a here's an example. With JFK, his yeah. cabinet, most of those men were self made millionaires in his cabinet. Yeah. Self-made from poor to – in George Bush's cabinet, all of them, like 70% were from Harvard and Yale. Yeah. So there's there's been a cl- – there's America has never been a, a country of classes. Like that's, not, that's a European thing. It's this country of classes. The Americans have been a country of meritocracy. Mm-hmm. But now it's becoming a class divide, just like we see in Britain. Like when, where in Britain, if you go to a certain place and your accent is off, then they know that you're – Yeah you're part of the the undesirables or whatever you want the yeah. deplorables <laughs> yeah no the uh do you think that there is a um do you think that there is a connection between the um the kind of Amer- american like military expansionism the um in like with respect to like the invasion of iraq and um and elsewhere throughout over the years and kind of the um the and kind of the the globalist class emerging with like the Davos folks and whatnot. Is there a connection? I think uh, it's hard. Let's look at the specific actors at play here. So mm-hmm. George Bush was George Bush, a globalist. I wouldn't say he's a globalist. Okay. I wouldn't say maybe his cabinet might've been, I think that, I think that Shaney was mm-hmm. Dick Shaney was a neoliberal, yeah. a neocon, a neoconservative. The neocons have been just as guilty in this as any, anybody. Mm-hmm. So yeah, Iraq, I think that you had to, uh, maybe not had to go into Iraq, but maybe it would have been better if it was a short-term thing and they said yeah. we had guaranteed to pull out in two years or something. Uh, I think you could have had the Iraq war and Afghan war without having the globalist aspirations, although yeah. they're kind of maybe linked by the parties that are that are carrying out these actions. But I think with Obama and um, Biden after him and Hillary Clinton before him, they are definitely globalists. Mm-hmm. Whereas George Bush might have been some redneck hick that would like he's i love him to death he's in, he's a but and then you look at the there was societies before davos like there's the mount pelerin society that was run by von mm-hmm. hayek yeah uh and then the party of davos i'm not sure what what year was it you know what year the party of davos was founded i think in the 70s 70s so that would be a while back too uh but yeah you've seen you've seen a merger of I think the Harvard, the, the Charles Murray said the sorting system, eugenics, is mm-hmm. very important in this because when you separate people by their IQ, over time that becomes a solidified class. Yeah. And so the people that all went to Ivy League school, and I went to a good school myself, mm-hmm. I probably could have gotten into Harvard at the time mm-hmm. that I applied. Uh, but the, is there a connection between Iraq and Afghanistan? Did it, not necessarily not didn't mm-hmm. have to happen by necessity, but I think it did happen by by yeah. by by um, contingency. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the um, 
Uh, yeah, the um, yeah, no, there's a there's a, a kind of kind of a joke in the in the United States that you know G- George Bush wasn't really running anything in, yeah. in, that, in that administration yeah, yeah. that it was you know Dick Dick Cheney. Kind of puppeting yeah. him. But the um, but it's interesting you uh you mentioned G uh Zizek or G- how's it pronounced? Zizek, yeah, you got it. Zizek, I got it. Okay, yeah. the um that he um. Uh, I just uh, I just learned about him in the last last few weeks. He's a very, oh, you're in for a treat. Yes, he's a very he's a very very charming. He's the, he's the gateway drug to philosophy. Yes, the uh, although you you have a pretty healthy religious and philosophical understanding already. Without having, he was the one that introduced me to all this philosophy. So, nice. but yeah, uh, you got a pretty healthy understanding of all that. Nice. Yeah, the, um, I I think I had it tangentially. Um, I think I saw maybe part of the. Um, the debate between him and Jordan Peterson on the Communist Manifesto. Yeah. The um. No, I like the. Uh, I like the. I saw one of one of his quotes, which I love. This the you don't you don't hate Mondays, you hate capitalism. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He, that, Here's a. He, did that, you watch that debate all the way through? Oh uh, no, I didn't. Okay, so they get to a to a head at the debate. Mm-hmm. Uh, Zizek says he's more of a Hegelian than he is a Marxist. Mm-hmm. But then Zizek challenges Peterson and says. Where, it, what exact thinker are you thinking of when you say postmodern neo Marxism? Yeah. And Peterson can't name a major thinker like Foucault or Derrida. These guys were postmodernists, but they weren't, or they may have been Marxists, but not postmodernists, because yeah. postmodernists don't believe in a grand narrative. Uh, but Pearson, Pearson, what Pearson's naming is the fact that there is an ideology called postmodern neo Marxism amongst the class of professor and academia. Mm-hmm. and elites it may not have happened in any particular thinker but it's a hybrid ideology that the elites and the the academics have and uh it didn't occur in any one thinker you can't name a thinker that said yes yeah. he he named but it is an ideology to happen and here's the thing that I've, I've i've just recently come to realize is that uh with hypocrisy and irony mm-hmm. these things in rulership and in sin on the earth have been with us since for since the dawn of time so, yeah. like for example, when they crucified Jesus, they put King of the Jews above his above his yeah. head, and they didn't see the irony in that—that that he was actually the King of the Jews. They yeah, thought they were mocking him by it. saying that. Yeah, that they were—they were like mocking him, like look at your your King of the Jews. Yeah, they, you know, they don't see the—they didn't see the irony in that. Mm-hmm. Humans can very easily engage in hypocrisy and irony without seeing any of it visibly to themselves. Yeah, and then and, the, uh, yeah. Yeah, and then correct me if I'm wrong, but the idea from from Jordan Peterson is that there's this kind of undercurrent of postmodernism that there's nothing in the world that can organize our perceptions. And, but then the the academics make the mistake, which is then you know it must just be about you know power and yeah. and class. So that's where the Marxist comes in. Yeah, it's a hybrid ideology where. Like I said, there's no one thinker that merged postmodernism with Marxism, but it happened as a class as a class ideological ideological phenomenon. So, yeah, uh, yeah the the idea that and they don't, they're not they're not even true Marxists because Marx believed in in classes, not in races. Mm-hmm. They've they've made everything about race, yeah, rather than class. Even though it is it's about class, it's not about race; it's about class. Like Andrew Tate says, like they're trying to divide white and black. Because they run to, like George Carlin said, they run to the bank with all their money. Yeah, there's this, uh, there's this meme which I saw, or it wasn't really a meme. It was more, it was like an infographic meme hybrid. But the, um, it was the that you know in 2008 to 2009 that there was this kind of coherent resistance after the um, Wall Street collapse to the kind of financial powers, and that it kind of shows that it the assertion that it makes is that they're cut. Kind of, is that the you know kind of Black Lives Matter you know race stuff and whatever is used at to to distract from to distract but from that um yeah that it's been of, it's been weaponized by the upper classes to divide yeah. the lower classes that's what it, that's what that's what it really is it's a weapon that they use against the lower classes to divide us and uh, what was I was gonna say Zizek says it says something he says something against the right wingers mm-hmm. he says. Since the collapse of the shared narrative, yeah, of the 1980s, 1990s, even mm-hmm. that's where the divide comes in the left versus right. The collapse, the the mega, the mega doctrine that America is a great country and it's a, a great deserving country and it's a great 
power for the force of good in the world. That mm-hmm. was a shared narrative all through the 80s, th- mostly through yeah. the 90s, through the early 2000s. And that's and he says right wingers decried that that's been lost. And that's yeah. true. That's actually true. Mm-hmm. We have lost the grand vision that America is a good country and a force for good. Yeah. And we've lost this because the upper classes are fine with man, like Steve Bann says, with managed decline. Yeah, they're fine with rule, getting richer as the country goes down. And uh, Victor Davis Hanson writes really. He's writing a book, a book called The Dying Citizen. He's a mm-hmm. good intellectual too. If you ever get a chance to see him, oh, Victor Davis Hanson. Victor Davis Hanson. Victor Davis Hanson. I'll he's really back. good. Uh, he he lives in California, so he sees his firsthand. But he says mm-hmm. California is becoming a medieval society. <laughs> Because you're either you're in Stanford, yeah. you're in the richest university in California and one of the richest in the country, and then you go a couple of blocks over and there's shanties and trailers of homeless people and and people living in trailers, so they're not homeless they're in a trailer, but they're they're right next to Stanford. Mm-hmm. And then the property of Google, Google's like there's five in the Bay Area, there's five trillion dollars worth of market capitalization in that area. Yeah. And yet there's homeless people a couple of blocks away. Yeah, and California actually has, I think it says one third of the people on entitlements in the states, and half the country's homeless. Mm-hmm. It could just be because of the climate too, because they migrate there because it's warm. But it could also be that, th- and there's a g- great guy in the uh, for the time for the New York Times did this piece on YouTube, a 50 minute piece where he says the most progressive. Mm-hmm. Uh, states that are all Democrat run. They have a Democrat majority in the co- in the legislature and a Democrat yeah. governor. No resistance, basically no resistance from, from Republicans, and they become the most regressive mm-hmm. states in the nation. Illinois, Illinois, with its school boards, uh, where they where it's different school boards in Illinois and like that in Chicago get the rich ones prop up and then the poor ones are right beside them, but they mm-hmm. got no money or the, the most, uh, the least taxes in the country are in Washington state where Bill Gates and Zuckerberg and all these tech yeah. guys get pay their taxes. And then in California, there's, there's voting for, to build housing like condos, but mm-hmm. then the locals vote that down to keep it single family households that are worth $6 million a pop. These houses, mm-hmm. And there's the most homeless in the country. So they're voting to have the least, the most regressive housing policy with the most progressive government. Yeah. You know, it's yes, an interesting but- phenomenon in social science. You'll notice that with IQ test too, is that the, it's not the questions that are most culturally defined that are the, the biggest spread between IQ, IQ class of cultures. It's, it's the questions that are most general, that are most general, that are most like, like basic mathematics. But that's the one where the IQ separation happens the most. Yeah. So the uh, so what? So I I I tend I tended at least to um, I, to dismiss Marxism just based off of the um, I guess the the effects of the ideology you had um you know tens of millions of um, you know casualties in the Soviet Union and China and Cambodia North Korea etc. Yeah. But the but so but what but I, I'm interested because like what do you what do you think about um Marxism because it seems like there's really this um this profound injustice with kind of this um Chris Lang describes it as kind of a an an overclass kind of s- siphoning itself off from the general population and this yeah. has occurred. So the thing that. about the thing about the class thing is that mm-hmm. in countries that carried Marxism furthest. The yeah. separation of wealth between classes was pronounced even more heavily. Mm. So with the Bolsheviks in Russia, yeah. they got even richer than the capitalists before them. They 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 appropriated all the villas, all the mm-hmm. all the all the palaces of the czars, and then they they got wealthier themselves. They were driving car, Rolls Royce cars, you know, like. Uh, so Marxism, I think Marx's critique of capitalism there's always truth concealed in half truth right mm-hmm. so marxism is inherently wrong and solzhenitsyn's solzhenitsyn showed yeah. that marxism would lead to the catastrophe that it did yeah inevitably by the ideas by the innateness of the ideas like pearson says people think true marxism has been tried out no it has been tried out and it mm-hmm. did lead to these, these consequences inevitably yeah and also i would say within marxism itself they are it's an elitist ideology because even what they say is we need a dictatorship of the proletariat but what that means is there's the bolshevik class of party that yeah. runs the country and becomes a class a class into itself 
yeah that runs the country so even within their their own house isn't in order and this is why i get back to saying people have no sense of irony mm-hmm. and hypocrisy when they're in it they yeah no sense of irony or hypocrisy uh the marxists were like solzhenitsyn said i believe what solzhenitsyn said that marxism leads these de- these these gulags and all these terrible cataclysmic events to humanity uh, well, there is a half truth. If you, I did a video series on the genesis of dialectical materialism, mm-hmm. and even the philosophy itself is corrupt because it says everything's matter moving, exchanging, energy exchanging. Yeah, I'm more of an idealist. I think I think I'm more of an idealist. Yeah, where uh, and I think in postmodernism with Jordan Pearson, with Zizek, with Chris Lang, we're returning to idealism. Yeah, I do believe that, and millennials and Zoomers especially like idealism as a brand yeah no, I, I i agree i think i think materialism is is seeing the the last of its days yeah but the um but it's it's interesting because the uh, i i guess they kind of kind of have this idea that like if you this goes back to the um the cruciform theocracy and the unification of kingdom and cross that the and um, mathematical metaphysics talks about this um yeah. kind of on his um video on his series on ctmu meta economics are you the guy that clips his channel i am the guy who clips his channel. okay we talk okay okay tommy because it's tommy yeah. right so yeah yes that, there you go. yes that's i the um but the um that yeah has this that i guess the idea which i kind of draw from that is like if you is that if you build a society that from from the ground up on the on the logos on the kind of principles of creation and the principles inherent especially in the in the ctmu that that um that it society almost organically organizes such that the you know it provide that there is prosperity that it provides for people's not only their biological needs but also their kind of spiritual and um, sure. And whatever else needs. Very well said. Yes. Uh, there's a saying that with Marxism, what the, there's the economic argument that says that it failed because of poor economics, because centralized planning isn't as good as distributed capitalist planning. Mm-hmm. But that's not the fundamental issue of Marxism. The fundamental issue of Marxism is it thwarts the human spirit. Yeah. It thwarts the human spirit. So when you have capitalism isn't a system that it's just we decided it's good, so we're going to use it. It's mm-hmm. a naturalistic way that humans have the fruits of their labor brought like back to John Locke. Yeah. The fruits you're, you're entitled to the fruits of your labor. Yeah. It's biblical too. Mm-hmm. capital wealth. Wealth is okay in the Bible. They say wealth can be a gift from God. Yeah. But it's when you take, when you have wealth and you say, I earn this on my own and there is no God and I don't owe this to God. But yeah. if you, if you, if you retain faith in God, as you get wealthier, there's nothing and I'm not a wealthy person myself, so mm-hmm. I'm even saying this to the benefit of people that are maybe have a crisis crisis of conscience and say, uh, mm-hmm. "I'm wealthy. Do, can I still be a Christian?" Yeah, you can. You can enjoy the fruits of your labor, and God, it's a gift from God. Wealth and capitalism is a way, a naturalistic way of comporting society to people have enjoy the fruits of your labor. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So the um. So um. Uh, so or I think I pro- probably have like ten, ten, ten or so more minutes. Like the um, but the um, I mean, it, interesting because the a lot of uh, Zizek, um, his things are about um the analysis of movies. Um, and you you, you said uh, on your Substack that your fa- that the best movie ever made was uh was Step Brothers. Yeah. Oh um, yeah. Could could you defend that assertion? <laughs> I could easily defend that assertion because it happens to be the truth. I used to think Braveheart was the best movie, <laughs> and cinematically, as a cinematic phenomenon, it is. But there's a thing with Step Brothers, and it's called the Brotherhood. Mm-hmm. There's a thing that when you, I, I don't know if the same applies in your life, but when you get a millennial, the age I'm 27, mm-hmm. uh, when you get a millennial around my age, or even a year or two, lesser or more, uh, you say Step Brothers, and they light up. They light yeah. up this ad loves, and you can quote any line, any line in the movie, and it just resonates immediately, effectively. I love making references to my jokes. <laughs> so I say, "What was this? What was I saying?" I love, I love. Have you, you've seen Step Brothers, right? I haven't seen Step Brothers. I'm sorry. To oh, <laughs> I'll, I'll, ha- I'll have to watch it soon. So there's this rich douchebag brother that uh, <laughs> exists to uh, Brennan. That's Will Ferrell's character. Mm-hmm. 
And some of his lines are my fa- actually favorite in the movie. He says, he goes up to Dale and they're both stay at home. So like they don't have a job. And uh, he says, well, I don't have the opposite of a problem, Dale. I made over for over 550 K last year. How much did you make? And Dale says, it's not about money. And he says, you know, it's not about money, but it's me. It's a little bit about money. And I made that mm-hmm. much money last year. <laughs> <laughs> it's just lines like that. And so here's the thing. It's a perfectly written movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's, there's absolute balance between the two brothers. That if you watch the movie all the way through, there's perfect balance between the two brothers. They're equal. They're mm-hmm. equal partners. So yeah. it plays on a millennial's love of brotherhood. Mm-hmm. And then uh, the the music is perfect. The screenplay is perfect. The jokes are all great. But then it's a it's a, t- a tale of the redemption of the fool. Mm-hmm. And Peterson says the fool is the precursor to the hero. Yeah. So instead, brothers, they become they they're the fool, the, the archetypal fool that becomes a hero, and and I think that, that speaks more to the postmodern times. Mm-hmm. I think Braveheart's great; it's a medieval raw raw get out there fight the enemy. But the thing that speaks to men in the modern society more is mm-hmm. that you can transcend your 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 increase and adolescence has been extended in our society. Yeah. So for the the step brothers, their adolescence was extended, but they still remedied it and became the fool became the hero. So it's perfect. It's a perfect movie, and it it it's, it warms my heart too at the same time. So, mm-hmm. yeah. What what well argued? I'll <laughs> I'll have to uh, I'll I'll watch it as soon as I. It's I also the funniest movie in on the planet. Okay. I think the only movie that comes close is the Holy Monty Python's The Holy Grail. That's a that's a good one. I ha- I have seen that one. Yeah, that's 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 a movie that stands the test of time. That Holy mm-hmm. Grail, because it's from the, like 74, 75, right? So, yeah. No, the um, uh, but, but before before we wrap up, I have a couple I have a couple lightning round questions. Some of these are not that great. They're like the um, they're like I I looked up basically like date questions. Oh yeah. <laughs> but the um, but the uh, but uh, but some of them are good, so I, I put some of them in. The uh, okay, so yeah. of, of um, of everyone, of everyone in history, the um, who do you who do you who if you were hosting, you know, a dinner party, who 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 is on your guest list? Um, this will be very politically incorrect. <laughs> it's actually three, if I can say three. Three. Okay. And they're they're all connected by a common string. Hitler, Stalin, Napoleon. Napoleon. Oh. What all three of these men were in countries that were attached to their home country that they became mm-hmm. emperor of. Napoleon was from the Sardinian Islands. Yeah. Stalin was from Georgia and Hitler was from Austria. Mm-hmm. And each one of them I I'm not supporting in any the, the <laughs> ethics of any of this. Full disclaimer. Full disclaimer. Do not do not but clip this. To produce an interesting dinner is what the question is, right? So yes. it's it's got to be. To me, I've I've read biographies on Stalin, and Hitler especially, but Stalin's mm-hmm. my main focus. Yeah. Uh, also, Hitler Hitler went from being a tramp on the streets of Vienna to being mm-hmm. a guy that almost threatened to take over the whole world. Yeah. There's something there's something in that that's like, whole like. How did he did it by the dark logos? Mm-hmm. And this gets to our, I think you said in your video, how does the logos come down from the mountain, or how does the logos transpose and map onto our world? Mm-hmm. I think it's a relational uh, event between you and Christ. Yeah. But how something like Hitler, I, I can't make sense of it because how did God give him the gift of the logo? God didn't give him the gift of the logos, so he got it somehow though, and then he used it. He was the most effective public speaker. In mm-hmm. history, Zizek says that Zizek says he's the most effective storyteller. He's also an antichrist and a satan, satanic figure. But I don't, I don't understand how evil can accrue that amount of power. Yeah, well, I think the, um, I think the um, that this is uh, Chris Langan talks about that the that say that Satan, it, that Satan as you know kind of need, needs to exist as kind of the logical counterpart to God, but that it's he's only given strength by the, uh, by the evil people who happen to exist in the world and make yeah. evil decisions, but that there, but that there is still a lot of power in the kind of coherent forces behind evil. Yeah. So I, I think that, I think that would be an interesting dinner. I think there's watch. something like Alexander Dugan talks about the dark logoi. Mm-hmm. So it's a, it's a bastardization. It's like a, a, 
not even a copy, but almost like like you're saying a counterpart to Logos. Yeah. Two Logos. And Pearson talks about this with excessive rationality. He says Satan is rationality in excess. So when you have rationality in excess, it becomes rational to kill people based on class, based on race. Based, like that's what the Enlightenment brought, right? Yeah. It becomes rational to do these things, but that's rationality in excess. And it's not – It is. it's obviously evil. Yeah. But it's also not the complete story. So they, mm-hmm. they were operating on assumptions that were – that were inherently evil, but also didn't have a, they didn't have a religious, there's no religion in anywhere, anywhere to be found. Yeah. So if you don't have God in your life as a, that's what Nietzsche said, the, the death of God, right? If you don't yeah. have God as the highest value. Yeah. That he predicted that, you know, hundreds of millions would be killed in the 20th century. Anyway. Because he knew that God was no longer the highest value. Yeah. And so when you don't have the logos coming down from the mountain, and I thought this like, if you were ever to get into a position where you were an absolute dictator of North America and you had listened to Jordan Pearson and you had listened to a band like my favorite band, Super Tramp, that's like an English band, uh, okay. how could you do any evil having mm-hmm. these men as your influences? Yeah. How could you betray them and do the evil? So Hitler and Stalin had these evil influences, mm-hmm. but how could we in the West with our with our good American and good English and good western idea how could we turn to evil after all this how could we how could we become fascist or communist or yeah. marxist leninist uh we have the capacity for evil but we keep it sheathed yeah and you do good in this world and you you do it under the authority of god i think mm-hmm. yeah yeah so the um so i uh, see if you um if you could have a um if you could ask God, you know, one thing to about about the future, about yourself, your life, the future of humanity, what what would that thing be? I'm really only interested in salvation, mm-hmm. but not even my own salvation. But will my parents be salvaged? Mm-hmm. So if it's, if it's a personal question, then yeah. I say, will my father, will my mother? find the love of Christ, will they be brought into the kingdom? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not interested in world events and that I am, I am intrinsically interested in world events, but when it comes to future, it has to be a personal future and God is a personal God. And so that's, that's pretty important to me. And and by extension, will my church congregation go to heaven or be resurrected and brought into the kingdom of God? Yeah. The, um, uh, yeah. So the, this is the, so what's the, um, you've obviously, you know, you've done a lot of, um, Scott of reading the, you know, the old Testament, the gospels, the epistles, you know, a lot of the scholarship around that. What, what's, what's the, what's the one Bible verse that kind of just sticks out to you? Man should not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God that, because to me, my the the centerpiece of my all my mm-hmm. studies is logos. Yeah, I think it's a mystery, but I think you pointed to it a little bit. I think logos comes down from the mountain. Like it's like Moses on the mountain. Moses gets the law, comes down from the mountain. Yeah, Christ goes up, sermon on the mount, goes down up on the mountain, preaches a sermon, comes down. Mm-hmm. How does and logos is relational, so Christ has a relation to each one of us. Yeah, and so the the thing that interests me is in that relationship. Christ almost gives you the logos. He almost gifts it to you as part of grace. And so, and I, I when I'm writing an article or whatever, or I'm, whenever I'm speaking, I don't know where it comes from. Mm-hmm. Psychoanalyst, psychoanalyst would say it comes from the unconscious mind. Yeah. I say it comes from God. Yeah. Tom Petty said the same thing in writing his music. He said, uh, I don't know where it comes from. It just co- comes down from like a light from a dove on, uh, as a dove on high just comes down. Yeah. And uh, so, it, man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of mm-hmm. mouth of God. I think that's yeah. probably it. Yeah, that's I, that's actually a, it, it's in my that's in my quote book. The um, I have a book of quotes which I've found inspiring. Great minds think alike. Yes, the um, there are a couple other good ones. The um, so the who is so at who of all the of all the bearded men in the world, who who is the best? <laughs> Not not with respect to their personal character, but with respect to their beard. Oh, good. <laughs> that's a good... You can't pick uh, yourself. I could probably pick a guy that's good. Oh, I can't pick myself. <laughs> uh, a guy that's good. I got to get more in touch with him. 
John Kelvin. Mm-hmm. I'd say John Kelvin or Marcus Aurelius. Overall, probably, probably, John, probably John Kelvin because he wrote the first systematic theology of the Reformation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and he was also, I think, he's a good person too. Mm-hmm. So that's a good one to pick. Yeah. Um. You uh. You wrote. I think. I think you actually did this on your sub sub stack. But the uh, what's you who who are your top top five philosophers of all time? Historical or present? Uh, well, anytime. Both. Anytime. Anytime. So, um, Jordan Peterson, mm-hmm. number one. I would say probably Chris Langan after him. Mm-hmm. Oh no, N.T. Wright, N.T. Jordan Peterson, N.T. Wright, Chris mm-hmm. Langan, mm-hmm. Martin Heidegger, mm-hmm. and who's the fifth? Who am I? Who am I missing? I say Zizek. I just say Zizek. And I'll get a lot of flag for that because people say, "Oh, he's just a he's just a popular." Ph-. He's he was what introduced me to philosophy, so I have to have mm-hmm. to give him that. I have to give him that. Pearson, because sometimes when you're speaking like a monk, you have yeah. to be understandable to many. Yeah. And understandable, you have to be coherent in yourself and understandable to many. So Pearson, N.T. Wright, Chris Langan, Heidegger, and Zizek. Those are my picks. All right. What what it, what's your favorite sport? Football. Football. It's a good one. Like, over, like American football. <laughs> <laughs> um, my, my favorite to play is to, I can't play football. I have a bad leg, but I can play tennis. So that's my second favorite yeah. sport. Who do you think's gonna win the uh, Who do you think's gonna win the Super Bowl this this week? Next week. Philadelphia. Philadelphia. I I I'm not. I think I want them to win too. Actually, so that's good. I was wanting Burl. I was wanting my team's Detroit Lions, obviously, because I live I live mm-hmm. near Detroit. So yeah. I was disappointed. That I'm looking forward to their season next season. Uh, I'm not really attached to any team, but I think Phil, I like Philadelphia to win. Yeah, I was like, all right, so the, as a new as a New Englander, I have to disagree, but the, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I I respect the, the opinion. The, uh, well, well, yeah. uh, what's his name? Uh, Mahomes is injured, so he. I, I didn't know that. The um, his foot. Oh, that's too bad. The um. Yes, this one. This one you are already alluded to the um, but the, but it it was, a- Andrew Tate top G or not G? Oh, he's the top G for sure. Top G. Oh yeah, yeah. And he kept they. What really fascinated me was he said his dad was a ma- grandmaster in chess, mm-hmm. and then he became a kickboxer. That's awesome. <laughs> That's awesome. A nerd can produce, and his dad wasn't a nerd, but a grandmaster can produce a world champion kickboxer. Mm-hmm. That's cool. That's cool to me. Yeah, yeah, no, I saw the um, but right before he was square squaring up with like Jake Paul at like an MMA fight or so, so something that he was like playing chess on his phone. Yeah, <laughs> he says he says he's rated eighteen hundred. Yeah, I thought that was funny. I'm not. Yes, this this one the um because I know the um you you said you you said you were Baptist, but the your original um your I I remember back back in the day when your your channel name was um Man in Theosis, was- which. Which I was going it? through a phase where I was reading Orthodox theology. Yeah, so I was gonna, ask, yeah. So the so the question is, philoque or philnoque? Philoque. Okay, so that's the clause where they say what is it? Correct me if I'm wrong. They say God from God emanates Christ, and from Christ emanates the Spirit. That's yeah. The so that the clause. so the joint procession of the um. Does philoque hold that that the joint like they both came out at the same time, or does it hold that one came came before the other? Or just that the Holy Spirit emanates both from God and Jesus, to my knowledge. So, philoque, I say no. I say no way because mm-hmm. they're the triune. One does not yeah. emanate from the other. They were all just like Christ was with God at the beginning, and mm-hmm. was God. And they're yeah. and the triune is that they're one person. Mm-hmm. I don't think I don't think God the Father. Em, I don't. I think this is a true claim theologically. God the Father does not emanate Christ or the Holy Spirit. They're all one, one triune person. Oh okay. yeah. So the uh, this is uh, I don't know if you've ever seen the um on the the, the Lex Friedman show the the last two two questions are always the the meaning of life and advice for young people so I'll uh, I'll I'll get I'll give you those two okay. the, um, the meaning of life and and the quest yeah, so, for what people. what is the meaning of life and enlighten me not vision what vision vision, vision. I made a list of traits that I think were best, and IQ was down like 
11th on the list. Yeah. The vision, and I tie vision with the logos inhering in you. The logos inhering in you. Mm -hmm. So in your life, that's what's guiding me through my whole life. More Mm -hmm. than IQ, more than talent, more than suffering is number two. Yeah. But the first one is the lo- praying to God each day, asking mm-hmm. for the logos to inherit you and it live inside your heart. Yeah. That's the meaning of life is to, it's a, if through par- prayerful theology to repent, ask God for the logos to inherit inside of you and your mm-hmm. life will, you, your mind and your body will be renewed each day when you that, do that. that. That's a good one. It's good there. practically and it's good concretely and abstractly as the, the single most important thing in life. Yeah, there, there's actually an interesting thing of like um, the I made I made the argument in one of my uh, my videos that the um, that the um, the development of um, of vision is a um, is a localization of actually the uh, the logos and the perception inherent in the universe. So I think I think that's exactly that's very good. It. That's a good definition. Yeah, and oh, that yeah. the and that um. And also the um, I don't know if you know Coronius Focus, who's um. Yeah, I've seen yeah, his, he did the right. video on the CTMU too. Yeah, and he did did a video on the CTMU, but a lot of his his other videos also kind of talk about the role of like perception and logos. Oh yeah, yeah. and that's I say vision and and maybe the logos without recognizing it first from my early life. But mm-hmm. vision was when I was youngest, I was playing with other kids. I would always be the leader of the of the kids at the, the tribal. We made like teepees and spears and stuff. And vision is what I would say is the most important thing for my mm-hmm. life. And then logo snaring in you is probably tied with that. Yeah. So, so lastly, what is your advice for young people, for myself, for your younger self, possibly for whoever's, whoever in the ether is watching this. So um, the, the, that comes with the corollary of the number two on the list. Yeah. I, in my early 20, when I was not, between 19 and 24, mm-hmm. I had a high threshold of suffering. Yeah. Like early life, especially as a young man, your life, you're you're expendable to society. You have a lot to learn. You'll yeah. you'll become you will become a better. The beautiful thing about the male journey is that you get better each year, mm-hmm. up till you're 65. So you start deteriorating physically. Every year in in succession is better than the last one. Mm-hmm. But early 20s is a period of suffering. But in that suffering, if you pray for the logos and hair inside of you, your mm-hmm. mind, body, and spirit will renew each day. And I'll, uh, I'll pray that you're you're part of the elect in that year. Yeah. Part of in the book of life, let's say. All so, right. Yeah. Th- thank you. Uh, a- any final words? Final words. Uh, remember that we must have justice, equilibrium, and charity. Mm-hmm. As as conservatives, as Christians, those three things. That's my brand: justice, equilibrium, and charity. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thomas. All right, that's Tommy. Fine.